My name is Danielle Fong, and my mission is to provide the technology so that people can have abundant, sustainable energy everywhere, for everyone. So my first message, and possibly my most important one, is that we're at a critical time because we really see a ray of hope. Technology to produce power from solar and wind has improved so much that the price of solar power has fallen like a meteor. It is now competitive with oil, with liquefied natural gas. It is incredibly cheap. It's not quite the cheapest in areas where people are producing or uh, burning coal, um, but in many places in the world, uh, in, in Europe, increasingly across the world, it is cheap. And it's only a matter of time before it is the lowest cost source of power almost everywhere. And there's a lot of it. There's more than uh, we could possibly need. And it's well distributed. In places where people need power, there's a lot of sunlight. But the, there is one challenge that must be overcome. Renewable energy, solar and wind, is intermittent. Here's a picture of the Earth, um, and as you can see, part of it's in shadow. There's no solar power at night. So the problem that I'm going to speak about is the problem of how do you store energy economically enough so that it's lower cost than power from fossil fuels. Before I do that, a message on how urgent the problem is. So because carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for a very long time, you can make a carbon dioxide budget, beyond which if you burn more, uh, you just have increasingly difficult climate problems that you have to deal with. And that carbon budget um, is exceeded by the amount of carbon dioxide already accounted for in the reserves of the fossil fuel companies and the countries that um, ship it out. And so actually, if you go through that fossil fuels already discovered resources, in business as usual, you burn through uh, the carbon budget in just 17 years. Just to review, that means flooding, flooding of Amsterdam and then New York if we surpass the safe limit of two degrees centigrade in temperature increase. Um, you have heat waves that, 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 that kill people. Desertification becomes a huge problem. Um, coral reefs are a problem. They, they mostly bleach or die. Less food, stronger storms, and species going extinct. So now is a really critical time to get in front of this. And one way that I put it is that since power plants last a long time too, that the power plants being built now will define the biosphere for the next 5,000 years. So it's really critical that we get this right. So how did I get involved? What's my personal story? And uh, I should get into this. A word of warning, it's a little unusual, but I think there are lessons for a lot of different people. The way I like to justify it is that I have patience for people, but I don't have patience for systems. And for me, personally, um, when I went into high school, I felt it was just moving too slowly and it wasn't focused enough on teaching people real skills to make a difference in the world. Um, so when I left, I found actually, to my surprise, I could enter university uh, at a very young age, uh, 12 years old, and I studied physics and computer science. <laughs> Thank you, hold the applause. <laughs> um, Starting early, I think, is something that a lot of people can do, but the most important thing is that they use their energies and move as quickly as possible to do something that they find truly important, that they can make a difference in. And when I chose what I needed to do for graduate school, um, I knew that I wanted to make a difference in energy, which I saw as the problem of my generation. It had to be solved in this generation. And initially, I started working on nuclear fusion, but again, I felt uh, it wasn't moving fast enough. This is a, a picture of the large nuclear fusion project in France. This is a, a graduate school student for scale. Um, it's a huge project, and I felt it was too big and moving too slowly to make a difference. The first power plant was anticipated in 2050, which it, obviously that would be too late to solve the climate problems that I cared about. So I left again, um, and I decided to try to develop my own capacities uh, and uh, to start a company. And I moved to Silicon Valley, uh, where strangely enough, after I started 
posting essays, people reached out to me, including a lot of extraordinary inventors and entrepreneurs, um, and I worked odd jobs and slept on couches, and eventually I met the people who would fund and, and, and join uh, my startup. Now, what was that on? So I noticed that the cost of solar and wind were coming down so quickly. And so, I, back to this problem, I knew that there was a missing technology, and I started focusing on the energy storage problem. Now, most people think energy storage, uh, to, to store energy, you can use batteries. But the problem is, to really best fossil fuels in terms of cost, batteries are too expensive and they don't last long enough. Basically, you dissolve and replate and, uh, ions over and over and over again, and it grows these strange structures which reduce efficiency and reduce capacity. And everybody who has a cell phone knows this. The, they don't last as long after too short a time. That degradation eats up the batteries, and you need something else. So I had the idea to store energy in compressed air. I'm not the only one to have had this. But the advantages are well known. You can store energy in tanks uh, in, with compressed air very inexpensively, and the tanks last for a very long time. Why hadn't people used compressed air to store energy all across the world? Well, people said that it must be inefficient, and there's a simple reason for this. When you compress air, it gets hot, and as you know from hot air balloons, uh, hot air uh, wants to expand, it fights you. And if you compress air to a decent enough pressure to store energy densely, it would increase in temperature dramatically. So the a pressure we use, 200 atmospheres of pressure, it would increase in temperature more than 2,000 degrees C. And all of that extra heat, unless you can capture that efficiently, that's a loss. So our focus was on increasing the efficiency of that process. And that's what we've done, and I'll tell you how. But basically, it's a, a really big improvement in, in efficiency. You can see that red bar there. That's the loss from the thermal loss that we've really shrunk down. And so that about doubles the efficiency of the round-trip process. So when compressing, you want the air to be as cool as possible, and when expanding, you want it to be as warm as possible. And we figured out how to do that using water spray. Basically, as you compress the air, sprayed directly into the compressor, we inject water, which keeps the air cool. And then you separate the water from the air and, and just uh, sort of this mesh filter thing. Uh, you store the air in air tanks, you store the heat in hot water tanks, which you can insulate and it's really cheap. And then you spray the warm water back in during expansion. So that was the idea. Um, I started a company, Light Sail Energy. Uh, this was in 2000. Uh, nine and 2010, we showed that this process would actually work. Uh, we did a proof of concept, um, and we we proved uh, vastly improved thermodynamic efficiency. Uh, then we started working on the product. Here are some of the pieces uh, we put it together, and this is what it looks like. Uh, in the process, actually, uh, my partner pursued a method of making really low-cost air tanks using carbon fiber. Um, so those are some people for scale. Uh, I should point out. Um, the compressor here, this is enough to power 500 homes. And uh, the, the tank there, if you have um, eight of them, that powers the 500 homes for uh, an hour. So that, that's kind of the scale. It's pretty large scale. Um, and here's some of the data. I don't know if I should really go through all of this, but um, basically uh, the process is as you draw air in, um, the volume increases, so this is pressure and volume. As you draw air in, uh, it fills up the cylinder, a valve closes, and it compresses as it goes up here, and it increases the pressure all the way up to 200 atmospheres. Then the valve opens, you push that air out, and the process repeats. And then to get energy back from the compressed air, the whole process runs in reverse, and it turns into mechanical energy and then electrical energy, right to the socket. And this is the uh, a graph that shows the process actually working. Um, so basically how to describe this is that the red line here is how um, efficient it was before and how far it moves up is how efficiently we compress without it heating up. The green is the absolute thermodynamic ideal and the blue is the water spray. Uh, the yellow is our efficiency following it. So uh, the compression process occurs. As soon as the water sprays in, uh, the efficiency dramatically improves. 
And so yeah, that's, that's kind of the process working. Um, so what does this mean? Remember this formula that I showed. Uh, on the left here, this is up top. This is the cost of energy from renewable sources plus the cost of energy storage. And then on the right, that's the cost of energy uh, conventionally. So if I just compare this here, this is roughly the cost of energy from uh, conventional sources during times when it is most needed. And on the left is uh, previous batteries, and you may have heard of uh, uh, Tesla Motors. They, they released a, a dramatic improvement in uh, battery cost, and that, that's on the right here. All of the different costs are added up here, and uh, you have the cost initially, the fact that you're paying a little more for uh, energy usage um, from uh, inefficiency and so on, uh, degradation over time, and that's added up. And as you can see, it, it's a serious improvement, but it, it is not quite competitive yet, so I'm looking forward to them improving that. Um, but right now, we have a, a method that we believe will be able to produce power at a lower cost than power from conventional sources. So basically what that means is that uh, people can go onto our website, ask for energy from solar power uh, whenever they like it, and we will go and install it, and it will, save, uh, it will save them money and provide power sustainably, and we'll split the savings with them. So uh, yeah, that's basically our story and our, our progress so far. Um, and we'll be releasing a product uh, in 2017, piloting in 2016. So.